Good morning everyone out there. Well, I love you and God has richly loved us. I am just so thankful for each and every one of you. I cannot tell you the joy. It just fills my heart to know that you're there not only watching but participating, praying for us and praying for one another and loving each other. I just give my thanks to you and thanking God for you. And of truth, you are, as I love to say, my heroes of faith. And I am so thankful for each and every one again. And I can't say that enough. I cannot, boy, just to commend you enough for all that you have done and are doing and continue to do. I do salute all of our mission churches. I love to include them every time because I know many of those listening in. And I just have to say welcome and we're listening in, and the boy, Brother Butch Fast and Tammy, and you guys' mar marvelous ministry back in the Ohio region. I just thank God so much for you folks and all of those. And then Southern Missouri there with Brother Larry Hopkins, and boy, our prayers are, are there with you. And uh, also, uh, just have to commend those those uh, mission churches that we have established here in Mexico, and boy, those believers there and different ones that has believed in other regions as well. Don't want to forget them and always keeping one another in our prayers. It's amazing how the old gospel is just it. It's the best news from God to all men, and it's for all, everywhere. You know, when this is all said and done, we'll all be just children of God. There'll be no other distinctions between us. We'll all be sons of God, and then, of course, there'll be those that'll perish in a devil's old hell. And what a tragedy for that to concur and to happen. But anyway, viewers, I give thanks for you tuning in this morning and tuning in whether you've been tuning in for a long, long time, as many has, and are with your brand new. And we sure do want to welcome any of our new viewers. And I pray that you just really do feel like a part of us. Again, I can't commend our church and all that you do, Pleasant View, all week long. And I see your text, and I oftentimes see the group texting that's done in particular, and also have received as well as know of and get reports of your phone calls that you do make to one another. And I can't commend you enough and just encourage you to keep it up. Keep it up. Your great love for the Lord is why it's ongoing and why you can't uh, just uh, slow up from your love for one another and touching each other during this pandemic the good works that you've continued to do without a general assembly. That's amazing that we've maintained and kept a faith that has been strong enough to propel us right through over a year now, or coming right on it anyway, a year now without services. And yet we, we just keep marching, we keep preparing, and we keep uh, moving forward. Uh, the good works that you have done is not lost, I assure you. Boy, God promises to reward each and every one and I know he does in this life, but I believe the greater rewards is what comes in eternal life. And I'm looking forward to those being just placed and, uh, upon you. Uh, I can't say enough about the texting that's done and the, the positive comments that are made, the posting that's really done and the wonderful things that get said there. And, and, and I really am thankful that overall in our body, Many have stopped that old bitter stuff and, and uh, on the Facebook and getting being participants in that or trying to crack somebody else that has been participating in it in a negative manner. Boy, just stay away from that, all that old negativism. Well, that should be about Jesus and loving Him and just really bringing the love of God for one another. Uh, keep up the phone calls and all that that you can possibly do as a tremendous church and I just can't... Uh, commend you enough for doing it and then exhort you to keep doing it. Uh, boy, let's don't be short in, you know, boy, in our good works, as the Bible says. Uh, you know, let's really redeem the time and keep pushing forward. We're really getting close, I believe, to maybe uh, boy, something happening where we can get back into services and getting them uh, cr cranked up. Uh, I can't uh, also just encourage you, though, church, and all your phone calls and stuff, but boy, try to remember, reach those that's kind of on the outside, if I can say it. I mean, meaning they're just not vocal, they're not well-known, 
uh, possibly, or they're just really kind of quiet people. And uh, we have several of those. And uh, and and they make sure they they if you can at all you think of one, boy, give them a call. I miss so many, and I, I oftentimes get really slack in my phone calling. Uh, I, you know, honestly, try to respond to uh, like one of the group texts. But if I do, I need to respond to the whole group, and that take hours upon hours. Anyway, guys, just really anything you can do, boy, just keep it up and keep moving forward. Remember those uh, again of our our uh, our seniors, uh, if I might say, and those that has a tendency of kind of being shut in and isolated anyway. But do everything you can to touch them as well. And always be in prepare and preparation in your own heart and mind for the return. Because we will return. God always brings his people back and they will reassemble. And I believe that will happen before Jesus comes back. This old pandemic stuff, we're going to get this put behind us, I do believe. And it really looks positive and encouraging the way things are really going with the vaccinations and all that. Uh, and I just can't uh, come in uh, and ask you to boy, be involved, get your appointments in there and get in whenever the opportunities arises. Uh, last week we got to do something really special on the proof, of, basically I call it the, the proof of salvation, the way we ended it in a way. But literally it's just the, the old gospel message and it coming boy, to a region of people that was without God, Gentiles. And, and they were so glad that they were to be for salvation too. That the gospel wasn't just limited to one in particular group, but that the gospel was going to be brought to all of them. And in that, they were so glad and they had received the words of God and the message of Jesus Christ as his Savior. And so we got to stress for the importance of the, of the scripture. And I've got to be able to share with you on two weeks now, trying to encourage you to be confident of the scripture as the old Nicene Council proposed what we call the Holy Bible. I promise you God's truths are all in there. Be so thankful for the written words of God, for the people that wrote those were breathed by God upon and they were moved of God as they inscribed these words that is written and I promise you God is contained in those words and his spirit comes alive out of those words and it's through those words that you've been saved and really born again. That's how you become born again is hearing the words of God and the spirit in them quickens your soul or brings to life your very soul and awareness of God and his love for you and the salvation that he has. Anyway, the very proof of your salvation is that you're so glad over giving the words of God, whether they're spoken or written or literally lived. And boy, they can be very lived and should be lived all the time. But there are those that you just know, know God by what they live and how they live. Uh, it's such a blessing to see. Anyway, those that are glad, they glorify. They glorify. Yes, that means to honor and praise and worship God, but it's an intensity of those three terms to its utmost. Uh, it is the extreme side to glorify is the extreme side of those words that we all do toward God. And they glorified God for his words, the value they placed upon the words of God and how we must be able to have that value and continue and appreciate the value and the authority they speak with. I'm just so thankful for God's words. He's the one that tells us to love. Just my little children just love one another. And we just stop all things and end all the buts and, and why nots and the maybes and all those things and just do what he said to do. Let's just love one another. You know, that'd be a different world, wouldn't it? if we was just really busy loving one another. And of course, if we were, we'd want something else to happen. That same word of God that brought us all that gladness, that inspires us to glorifying to God, that showed us that we too were appointed to the salvation God's had for us, and that we can't help but believe that salvation in Jesus Christ, to live that Jesus lived for us, that Jesus died for us, 
that Jesus put away everything that was wrong with us and he raised us perfectly without sin in himself. That we're all right, work is going on to heaven just as soon as we get on through and get our little bit of work done. And that little bit of work, according to that same text, is the work of spreading the gospel, which is exactly what needs to be done. And my friends, boy, there's an urgent, urgent need that we have a great necessity that that old gospel message be preached far and wide and done with the Spirit of God that's filled with love for individuals and people, no matter who they are, and of all walks of life. I cannot stress that enough. That it was, because, you know, the, 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 the last proof of really experiencing the words of God and being saved yourself and knowing that you're an appointed or one of the elect is not only that we have heard the word and received it, but that we're glad over it and we glorify God over it and that we believe that word. And then the last is to spread, spread the word. And it says, and they spread the word throughout the region. You know, the region's where we live at. It's where we're walking, that's your region. It's where you're going to work and coming back from work or, or the, you know, the, the trail that you really uh, live in your daily life. That's your region and you cross people all the time, left and right. Boy, spread upon them the good news of Jesus Christ. Tell them the words of God and the testimony of God. And of, yes, it is of a grand necessity because you see, we live in a world that's all snake bitten. And yes, I'm saying that's <coughs> snake bitten. <coughs> and yes, that's what I want to speak to you about today. Yes, snake bitten. Or you could say snake bite. And if you would, go ahead and turn to with our text. It's in John's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. And then the real meaty part of our text is Numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. And the text from God, John's Gospel, I'll read it first, is the words of Jesus, and it's right there at the same time that he'd been speaking to Nicodemus, and rolling kind of from that, that there to almost John 3, 16, it says in verse 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever will just believe him, that whoever will believe him, now he's got to be lifted up, but then whoever will just believe him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh my goodness, my friend, you can have everlasting life, and I'm not kidding, that's an everlasting union, intimacy with God himself in every way. Forever a part of God and God forever a part of you. Everlasting life. My goodness, oh, what joy that should bring. Now, if that's not enough for you, let us go ahead and finish reading that text. Because he says, for God then so loved the world that he gave us this Jesus to be lifted up. He gave us this Jesus who was his only begotten son that out of love for us, that through the gift of Jesus, his only begotten son, whoever will just believe again in him should not perish, but have everlasting life again. For God did not send his son in the world to condemn the world. God's never been about condemning the world, but that the world through Jesus, through him, might be saved. What God's always been about is saving people. You see, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe, he is condemned already. He's already in that state of being con condemned because he's not believed in the only name. He has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God, which is Jesus Christ. Now, my friends, that's enough right there. But if you notice, this all starts with the idea that Christ said, just as surely as old Moses lifted an old serpent back there in the wilderness, a tremendous story that we're about to read and look at, that as surely as Moses lifted up that serpent, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. 
that whoever, whosoever, if you just will look to him, if you will be live, will just make a look at him and live what he's done for you. He's the one lifted up, and if you'll live this, then you'll understand how that can save you from your snake bite, if you would, or save you from all your sins. And back in Moses now, where we pick up the story. And it says, Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. This is Numbers chapter 21, verses 4. And the soul of the people became very discouraged, is one version. On the way. Now, it's very important. Now, their soul was discouraged, but they were on a way. They were on the way. You know, the way they were really going is to heaven. You know, the way we're going right now, we're all just in this together, and we're all going to heaven. And I, I pray, well, God will make this real to us this day. And the people then, after they had grown, oh my goodness, discouraged on the way, they, they grow disheartened on the way, they, the people, then begin to speak against. Oh my goodness, they spoke against God and against old Moses. <laughs> Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness, they said. For there is no food, there is no water, and God had given them foods and given them water. And then they say, oh, our soul lows on the unworthiness of your bread. It's not even worth having. So the Lord sent fiery serpents, and we'll speak on that, but he sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Oh, tragic, lost, and that died there. It means they lost their, even their souls into the devil's hell. They died eternally separated from God. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, Oh, we have sinned. So those that hadn't died from their snake bite yet, they came to Moses and said, Oh, we've sinned. We have sinned. They confessed what they had done. For we have spoken against the Lord, and we spoke against you. Pray for us. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was as if a serpent had bitten anyone when he looked at the bronze serpent, that fiery serpent on fire, fiery serpent, the person that looked to it, he'd be healed or lived. He lived instantly from his snake bite. Oh, my friends, the truth is, but that's exactly what's happened to all of us. We've all been snake bitten too. And boy, do we ever need a cure, and God's provided one. And I'm so excited to tell you about the cure that God has provided for all of us, my dear friends. Uh, yes, uh, but, you know, it's amazing as, as we have shared with you about the old snake bite, and I want to share with you a little bit personal, if I might. You know, I know a little bit about snakes, not a whole lot. I avoid them at all possibilities. Matter of fact, I really don't even enjoy looking at them at the zoo or a place like that where they're in total confinement and there's no way in the world they could bite me, but I still, boy, I'm very cautious when it comes to snakes. But I came from a region born up in southern Missouri, a little town called West Plains back then. Uh, and, uh, you know, that region back there, uh, my dad owned a farm and it actually homestead, the old homestead place. It was only 60 plus acres, maybe around 65, 68 acres, uh, something like that. But over time, my dad also 
uh, at least and probably ran over 1,000 acres and I think a couple of times around 2,000 acres uh, at a time back there in those southern hills and southern areas of Missouri. And uh, back there that's filled with lots of lakes and creeks and rivers and uh, there's just water running all over everywhere. Rains quite often, thunderstorms and the like. But there is a, 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 an infestation, is all I could call it when I was growing up, of these things called ticks. Now a lot of people not too familiar out here with ticks, but boy, ticks was a common thing there. You couldn't walk to the barn, as the old expression was, without getting into the ticks. A uh, little animal that was even worse, that I swear the old devil made, is chiggers. There's a little bitty little red substance, you couldn't hardly see them, but oh, they would make you itch all over, and these little chiggers would bear down in your skin, and you'd see maybe just a little red mark. That was a chigger. And then, of course, there was tons of mosquitoes, especially through the rainy, rainy times, and then everything that grew back here had thorns and thistles, I swear. Yes, uh, but the worst of worst of all the uh, plagues, I might call it, that that place had was snakes. And I mean snakes. My poor old mother goes bitten twice in her lifetime, and maybe, maybe another one or time or two and didn't even know it, but I do believe twice that she was well aware that she had been snake bitten. Um, no, the snakes is just everywhere. You couldn't, you know, I mean, that's the honest truth. Those creeks and rivers, all oh, that's pretty to look at them, but you couldn't go down a bank anywhere that it wouldn't be long, you'd see a snake or two. And that is all kinds. There was a, the whip snakes, there was the old water moccasins, and then what was called a cottonmouth snake. Yeah, there's the copperhead snake. It's kind of had a copper head, and almost all of these were very venomous and would definitely make you very ill and sick. I mean, the, the houses, I remember one time opening a feed sack that we had a slow scoop that you scoop in the food sack and lift out a portion of grain and stuff for animals to eat, and I'll be dang, I'm about to stick that scoop in there, and there was rolled up there a big old copperhead snake about to bite my hand off. And uh, uh, to needless to say, it, it scare you to death. And like I said, it's creeks and rivers would love to go fishing, but oh, you had to contend with the snakes all the time. You run down through the summertime and want to go swimming, you had to make sure that the old water moccasins wasn't all around because they're territorial and they'd have a batch of babies and they'd all map out a part of the creek and if you got in at any place up and down there and their little part, boy, they all came after you all at once. You see, the, when the Bible speaks of these uh, physical things such as snakes and Moses here, I get a real understanding of what, the, what is really meant by this. The fear that it creates and the realization that death is just right there, that there's poison and uh, boy they can bite you anywhere. Something that is a little different out here, most of the, out here we have is the rattlesnake and at least that dead blame thing will rattle at you and try to get you to go another direction and not just uh, without reason or question will just try to strike or bite you. But uh, usually it tries to give some sort of warning. In the old rattler, back there, those snakes, they ain't no kind of warning. They laid for you. They couldn't wait to get a chance to bite you. <clears throat> and I learned from this that a lot of the physical things that God has on this earth is to teach us spiritual things. There's many things that could be learned even from the bad experiences of such things as snakes, as we can find out. Oh, pleasant view and viewers, <clears throat> uh, boy, mankind... Uh, has been bitten by the most venomous snake of all. It was called an old serpent long ago, and at that moment it, it was some form of an animal that was the most beautifulest of all. It was also the most cunning of all, and it had a speech or could speak that was unbelievable. It could raise all kinds of questions all in one breath, and yet, with the assurance and surety, could absolutely convince you of its certainty 
that whatever it said, it was the way it was. Just like the old Satan did with Adam and Eve, as he said right there, as he spoke. <clears throat> and it really, you know, really just gets me how he worked at and spoke and said, oh, you won't really die. Now this is after God had said, and the day that you eat thereof, thy shall surely die. And that death is a three times or three times over death. And that's the kind of snake bite poison old Satan brought to old Adam that day. You see, it's a death that separates you from the relationship with God, an intimate relationship that we at one time had totally enjoyed. And then through that old sin and that old snake bite right there, we lost it and now only have it just through faith from after we get to hear the gospel message and come to believe that message and live by faith in that message. You see, the truth of it is, uh, old Satan, who was cunning and beautiful and could speak so well, can raise these questions like, oh, did God really say, did he really mean that you wouldn't eat any of the trees of the garden? And that wasn't what God said at all. But he can raise with questions and make you question, and pretty soon you're questioning everything which leaves you subject not to be believing God when that's the only one you should be listening to and the only one you should believe. And yet with all those questions and uncertainty, uncertainty, he has such a way with the uncertainty that he raises with questions to twist it right back around and implant an absolute certainty. Oh, you won't really die. You won't really be separated from God. You really won't go to hell. You really won't die. Instead, there'll be you, and you can live in you, and you can think for you, and feel for you, and desire for you, and all the elements of the soul can be just used for you, and in that, you can be God, like God. See, you be in control of you. Isn't that something? What a lie that old Adam took thereof willfully, the scripture said, and he ate into that old snake's poison, and he killed us all dead. It separated us, yes, it did, spiritually from God. It killed us. We began a process of aging from that time on and dying in a appointed time of death and then a judgment that determines eternal death because we're already condemned to hell, separated from God forever and ever. And it's an amazing thing in such a death and poison that old Satan has brought us and brought into this world. And yet, uh, this uh, old poison it leads to another thing. We're all snake bit dying, and then we don't really know it. We don't believe it. We, we keep thinking that we can fix it ourselves. And then we've turned, and actually they've just risen up right among us, and it's Satan behind all them. But he turns and says, oh, I've got your help. I've got you some great help over here. We'll fix your snake bites and we can fix what's all wrong with you through the means of religion. See, we can give you some things to do and systems to follow and, 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 and works to be fulfilled. And through these works and deeds and, and through uh, everything else, you can surely just fix yourself and you'll be okay. And after all, God will surely understand in the long run. And after all, if all that fails, just accuse one another, accuse somebody else, claim that it's everybody else's fault. Just blame others. You know, my friends, we've been through a world right now, honestly, a political world, and I don't even like to get into any of that, but where blame and excuse and all this old same old lies has been told and told again and again till people really just don't even know what is true anymore, it seems to me. When the gospel's what's true, when Jesus is what's true, the Spirit of God is true, it's loving one another, caring about each other, caring about God, just wanting people saved from this old life and world. This is not your home, my church, you are pilgrims. We're just passing through. Don't try to embed yourself in the affairs of this old world. Man, let's go on to heaven and let's be sure to take everybody possible with you. If we're not, well, the honest truth is, you're snake bitten. 
You're right back there in the old venomous mess that uh, you've always been in then. No, sir, religion never fixed nothing and it never will. It takes God to fix anything. And it's God, once again, that comes through here, as we'll see. But snake bitten means that we're living under the influence and the poison of that snake bite. Yes, we're literally slaves as they was there in Egypt. They were slaves to old Pharaoh, and they served uh, him. And they ate such a grand diet, they complained about God's bread. My goodness, they had onion soup, and what that was really was ajo, uh, that's garlic, garlic soup. Oh, dug up garlic, and they cooked it, boiled it down, and that's what you had to eat. And, uh, and, and I guess it's somewhat nutritious because somehow they could endure the whip and all the things they went through, but it's all because they were snake bitten and under the poison and delusion uh, of the powers of Pharaoh. And, him, and honestly, we are under the power of old Satan and the beast, the me, the my, and the you. Yes, uh, uh, God is well spoken long ago. And he says this so clearly. He says, you know, you really want other gods and he can't figure out why on earth you want to. You see, the truth is he's the only really loving God. He's the provider of everything. I mean, just think about it. What is there is that exists that he didn't make in the first place? What is it that you've ever gotten that he didn't either allow you to get it or literally himself give it to you? You see, truth is God is the only one that really loves us. But if you insist on making something else your God and serving it and living for it and you want to live snake bitten and dying on that venomous poison that you'll have pumping through your system on the days that you exist here on this earth, well, he says, I guess, well, just go ahead because whatever you're going to live for and worship other than God, that God will turn around and beat you. You can make it if you're God, all right, but he'll just turn around and beat you and you know, I have personally found out that to be true. Every time I look to something else to fulfill me, to satisfy me, somehow it just turned around and beat me all of my life. And they'll do the same thing to you. I just pray that we can understand uh, and something that is really, really sad today. There are so many that are snake bitten and yet God has done such a marvelous act of mercy and grace. That's what he's had on us, Pleasant View, each and every one of us. God hasn't given us what we deserve, but he called us with that gospel and the person Jesus that he put up there on that staff that we can look to and could be saved. Yes, God is rich in mercy, not giving us what we deserve, but instead coming to us with salvation. And it's a mar marvelous thing that he'd do such a thing. And yet, as it was for them, and, and they're out there, here come God to them, and he delivers them, provides a Passover uh, 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 for them, that the death angel would pass over them, and that they could all be free to go to a promised land and live on the promises of God till they enter the eternal kingdom of God. And so they're off to the land, and that's where they're going in the text that we just read. And in this text that we just read, I pray I read that text, I may have not have. Uh, yes, uh, I believe I did. Anyway, I pray you read it if I didn't. I uh, hope you'll read it on your own. Uh, yes, Numbers 21, uh, verses 4 through through. through through eight. You know, I'd even do some things right, but I even forget I do them. So, uh, you know, that's amazing right there. I can't remember for sure if I read the text or not. I've read it so many times in preparation of this message. Yet, you know, the one thing that is shocking about being snake bit is one is that when God comes to you and blesses you with the opportunity of salvation and the cure, and yes, it is a walk of faith, and that's what they did. They had to follow Moses, and Moses let them out, and yes, they had to go through a wilderness, and they had to experience some things and learn to trust God and depend upon God and not themselves and all the old poisonous ways that they had previously lived. 
but in doing so we find that they've become very discouraged along the way the scripture says on the way and I just want you to think about that on the way Jesus is our way out of here into the kingdom of heaven and my friends we're going there don't get discouraged along the way because the honest truth if you really become discouraged it's a tragedy but I'd have to say that you're snake bit all over again and I'll be doggone sometimes I just can't get it you know as we are going through this world church we are those who God says we are pilgrims we are sojourners we don't belong here the heaven is our home it's our destiny we don't want to stop until we get there man we just use some of the things here give thanks to God for everything we have we have a house we call it our home honestly it's not our home well, it's heaven that's our home boy it's him that we're going to uh, but we have to, to pass on by we're called passerbys all this here we're to pass on by and go on to heaven but all oh, they are those that begin on their journey and they said boy this is a long old journey all of a sudden they complain on the way on the way to heaven and they begin what's called murmuring whispering and even backbiting as they did old Moses and then God himself yes uh, boy it's an awful thing because you see these are people that had heard enough of the gospel message to follow Moses this far if they had just gone on they'd have made a heaven they could have been having eternal life that's like getting snake bit and finding a cure and while you're being cured then you turn right around and get snake bitten all over again now church you know and I know of several that has done that right in our very midst you knew that they was in trouble because of the bitterness that came forth out of their old mouths and their tongues and oh yeah they had stories and reasons and lies and oh they can make it sound so right on and good but all it was was to be against to be against what God was really for and what God has done and whom God has called as well yes my friend that is a, a tragedy of tragedies and I just have to say it all be doggone when a person has been bitten and then cured and turn around and be bitten all over again uh, and, and end up dying from it as so many has. Yes, my friend, the good news uh, though is, you know, kind of the message behind that is don't get discouraged on our journey on home. Boy, let's keep on going. Uh, the, the, let's not fall back and get snake bitten all over again have that old venomous poison of death reeking back through us and reeking for others you know when you're bitten by a snake all you do is turn into one yourself and all of a sudden the salvation that you once hoped for you don't even have a thought of that for anyone else and you sure don't even have it for yourself you see they rose up and they spoke against God oh my goodness and they spoke against Moses. Now, i got to say with God, you know, he's the one that gives you everything. The next breath that you have, it's God. And you're going to speak against him? You're going to be against? And think of that word against. It is not a mystery. You don't need a science lab to figure out somebody being against. When people come up against me, people seen it five miles away. Those that really believed Jesus, that loved him, that was cured of their own snake bite. When they seen those others coming with the old venom and poison behind it, even though they could whisper and make it try to sound so sweet, they knew it miles away because of the old bitterness that was in them, that they were really against. You know, you're either for, yay, God, yay, Moses in this case, lead us on, or you're against, oh, I ain't doing it. oh this is wrong, oh, that, and that is exactly what took place there. They spoke against Moses. And, you know, if you think about it, that's what I've had the same experience many times over. And, you know, may I ask, you know, who brought the first uh, cure, you know, along? You know, God's the one that provided it, but you know who brought it to you? 
it was it was it was me and the sense of pleasant view it was Moses that brought it to the people right there brought them God's message it's God's cure and brought it to them and man if it wasn't for old Moses where would they be back in slavery and already dead probably you see the truth is they you know the, they turn on the very ones that brings them the words of God that brings them the cure from their condition and their situation, from the venomous old snake bite that they were dying from. You see, uh, you know, think about God just for a minute. And about how, who is it that strengthens us, enables us to walk from day to day? Who has heaven ahead of us? Oh, my friend, look for that and rejoice in the Lord. Be glad and thankful every moment that we may. Boy, he's the one that's made us right. You know, they complained against God and said, Oh, you brought him Moses and said, He brought us out here to kill us. Uh, he said, Man, you hadn't fed us. And, you know, he gave them manna from heaven. He, he, you know, struck a rock and provided them water, fresh, clean, uh, gushing water every day. Uh, he's the one that provides us all of life. And then he brought us a bread that they murmured about, manna. But the real bread he brought was Jesus Christ. He's the bread of life. And my goodness, he bringing you Jesus, you can have eternal life. And that's exactly what God brought to them. But you see, snake-bitten people, they don't think very well. You see, they're poisoned in their own mind. They murmur and they're against. And they uh, complain and honestly, they lie. You know, God didn't bring them out there or Moses didn't either one. To die, he's bringing them on to a promised land, a land of milk and honey. And that's what life can be, an abundant life for you if you live it in the Lord. If you try to find it out of the physical things of here and you try to look for man's answers of the things of here, I promise you, you'll never find an abundant life here. Even those that think they've got so much and has become very wealthy, all that, they can lose it in a breath what is it if you gain the whole world, Jesus said, and lose your soul in hell? My goodness, you lost it all. You see, the truth of it is, my friends, uh, by the consequences of their murmurings and the snake bites that it caused, there was many that died. Now, I think there's, there's all bitten or being bitten. There's day and night. Snakes were everywhere. They couldn't walk right and turn left, and they were bitten by fiery uh, serpents it says fiery serpents and boy so the sting of their poison was like fire itself and that fire goes into the system and it burn them through and through and it, it says that many many that was once of Israel died no longer there no more they died eternally died forever and then uh, the, the real positive thing about this and I must really say that God does this very thing, and it's God that really has brought those serpents. Now, he does that to get his work of grace done. Now, he does, you know, there are those that say ugly things. Oh, God just wants to judge us. Oh, it's God that tries to condemn us. Oh, it's God that wants us to perish. Again, it ain't God that wants you to perish. God just wants you saved. He wants you forgiven. He wants your sins to all be blotted out and put away. Uh, he don't want to punish you for your sin. Now, isn't that something? He doesn't want to punish you for your sin. He just wants you to be forgiven of your sin. That he can just let it go and he don't have to punish you. Uh, he doesn't get an extra thrill out of punishing you. He wants you forgiven and he can let it go and not even have to remember it anymore. He wants it gone, blotted out. And that's what happens when you come and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. When you look to God's cure as they had to look there. But you see, you know, once you're bitten and once you're in the snake poison, you can't see where you're at. And that was the same thing with them. And that's why God uh, boy, uh, sent the serpents so that they would be bitten and so they'd realize what they're really already dying from. See, they was already dying. 
because they'd already murmured, they'd already turned back. They were already in a state of unbelief. They're dying and going to hell already, it's the honest truth. And God sent fiery serpents, so when it got real, real to them, the condition that they were really in, and in the realization of their condition, then they came, they came to Moses. You see, you have to be awakened to your real condition, that you are a sinner through and through, that you die in your sins, separated still yet from God, Believe in all those ugly things that God's out to get you. And you think he sent serpents to harm you. No, it's to awaken you that you might know that that's what you're already in. That, that you're already living dead and already three times dead. And my goodness, my friend, if you're allowed to just stay there, you'll perish and die for an eternity and your soul will perish in hell. Oh, God, yeah, God just wants you to realize, to realize and to be able to come. And so he had, oh, uh, in realizing their condition, they did come to Moses. And they said to Moses, oh, we've sinned. Oh, what a marvelous statement. See, confession comes, and guess what? And remember what old John says, if you confess your sins, and he says it to the brethren, so we've been present actively. My goodness, if we just confess our sins, he's faithful and just to always forgive us of all of our sins. No, oh, you don't have to think about sin. Just, boy, confess. That's what we are. That's what we've done. And he's the Savior from all of our... Jesus is our Savior from all of our sins. Yes, they came and they sought intercession. The old Moses, who they turned against, all of a sudden, he's a needed fellow now. They want Moses to pray for him. And I'll tell you something about the heart of a pastor. You know, I've had some people I felt like done me very, very dirty, very wrong, and I could puff up and go through all my uh, reasonings. But let me tell you, friend, the heart of a pastor, it won't let you live any other way. You see, it just wants what God really wants. And every true pastor knows what God wants is everyone just to be forgiven. You see, for every person that's risen up, that's rebelled, that spoke against God and against me, the only thing I want them is to be restored, to be saved, and to get back and get healed, and to get to know the Lord, and know His mercy and His love and His grace. Ask Him. Uh, they told old Moses, ask God to do something about our condition. And so, you see, they come for a cure. And boy, there is God again uh, through Moses there. In Moses' intercession, God comes with deliverance all over again for all this gainsaying, is what the, another text says, uh, people. And boy, did he get them a, get them a cure. The cure would be, he told Moses, to administrate. So he had to administrate and he had to fix a serpent. And it's amazing how this thing evidently had to be made. I thought about it a lot this week, but it was a, a, a fiery serpent. It had to be on fire. And so I believe it was something shaped in a miniature like little stove of some kind, filled with some sort of flammable materials, coal or something. And it was placed upon the pole or a straight staff and it was lifted up over the people. And then uh, another interesting part is that it was, it was uh, uh, let me see, the, the term gets translated paraded, demonstrated. It was demonstrated or prated about throughout all the camp. So Moses took this cure that God had made, uh, which was a burning serpent, and it was placed, so it's on some sort of fire, so like a stove or something that could have the flames in it, some sort of fire on this big massive stick that Moses could carry, and he carried it through the camp. And everybody that looked, that would just look to that, that fiery serpent, and through the poison of the, that they had taken in, that they would be healed from their own poison by the look to what God's provided, that would save us from all of our sin. Uh, and the truth was that as every one of them had been snake-bitten, 
And the truth is for you today is for you to know, my friends, we're all in the same boat. We've all been snake bitten. We was all previously bitten in that old Adam. Yes, but we were really was. You're qualified and you need to understand you're qualified that you can look to what God's provided. And if you look to what God's provided, yeah, I promise you, boy, the sins that you've done will be washed away. The death that it's created and the hell that you had justly deserve, it won't be for you no more. No, sir, look and you shall be saved. I love Jeremiah, and he makes that statement many times there throughout that book. Just look unto the Lord, and thou shall be saved. You can't look any place else. Your neighbor can't save you. Husbands and wives can't save you. Guys, this world can't save you. The philosophies of it, the politics of it on all sides, none of it's going to save your soul. None of it can take away a sin. But what God provided in the person Jesus, it can do it once and for all. And just to, to highlight that, I do want to come back and point out that notice how there with Moses, anyone bitten, and I'm trying to stress the fact that we've all been there, we've all been bitten, we've all been in that condition, and we know what it is to be sick and dying from our bitten state. But here comes God and His marvelous love and His work of salvation to each one of us. And as He sent His only begotten Son into this world, that He might become that snake for all of us. And He really does so. And I just want to share with you that it's this Jesus, God's only Son, that became one of us in the flesh. Boy, right there, snake bitten. He took and bared that old lost nature that each one of us have. And every turn in our own lives, we sin with that old nature. We miss God. That's what that means. There's not one thing about that nature will ever, ever measure up to God. It missed God at every point in phrase. But Jesus took that same old nature and perfected it to the will of God. Kept it perfect, even fulfilling the laws of God in thought and in intent as well as in letter or deed. In every way, Jesus is the total purity and righteousness of one in the flesh that was lived that he could offer himself as an old serpent. And a marvelous transition takes place if you follow the life of Jesus and that I wish to share with you and close out with you. So boy, please hear this. It was, and it's so easy, easily stated, as Moses lifted up the serpent, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Boy, what is amazing is that transition. Jesus goes from being a perfect one of 33, 34, 36 years upon this earth. Perfect flash, law, standard, everything always kept. And God, oh my goodness, is so perfect. In, the, in meeting this standard of perfection, the only one that was righteous and right, a right one that could die for all those guilty ones. And this one right one, this one Jesus, transcended to something else. He sure did in the hours somewhere there through the mockeries of trials, through the trip up old Golgotha or Calvary's Hill, to being nailed upon a cross and suspended between heaven and earth. During this time right through there, he was being made into a serpent himself. Yeah, he bared our sin and the poison of it all. Venomous old stuff that we've all done. Jesus bared it in himself. He took all of our poisons in his own bloodstream. He took all of our nastiness and sins and held them up right there before a holy God. He suffered the consequences. He was smited, stricken, the Bible says, and put to death there upon the cross. And it's he that was lifted up, all oh, lifted up. Oh, that's such a marvelous statement. Because, you see, it's Jesus, as he was lifted up, what that would mean, literally dangling over the world, if you could say 
Or we could say right there in the moment from Golgotha, the big hill outside of Jerusalem as it sat down in the valley, that, oh my goodness, there was Jesus kind of up and above it all. That everybody and everywhere could just look to Jesus, how they too could be saved. Oh my goodness, the city of Jerusalem, the city of peace it's supposed to be. Oh, uh, uh, how uh, Jesus who becomes sin for us, becomes our, with our sins, uh, and the venomous sin and sickness, the death that it would create, the crime of crimes, the poison he bared uh, that we've all done, he bared in himself. He was snake bitten in every way. And he, in our place, died for us. It is Jesus who dangles from the cross, who slumps in his submission to eternal death, handing his soul over for judgment. It is Jesus in this condition that whosoever, that includes you, my friend, if you just look to Jesus right now and say, Lord, I'm going to believe what you did for me will save me. And I promise you, you'd find a rush that would come over you, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden you'd know you have been saved. Oh, friend, you can make your election assured because the key word is to believe, to believe what God did in Jesus for you. There's Jesus again, if I can say it this way, and he's dangling above us all that's been snake bitten. All we need is look to him. And by the way, that look, oh, Jesus went on. He went on into the eternal death of hell. He in three days purged all of our sins, all of its poison, all of venom, and he purged it right there in hell and left all that old death stuff right there. He was raised the third day in perfection, and you that believe in him are raised in him in his likeness in absolute perfection. He is raised, but oh, it's looking to Him. And as long as we're in this old world, we got to keep looking to Him. Lift up your eyes, O church, each and every one. Never let a moment of discouragement come on you. My goodness, you got eternal life. Look to the glory of God. Look to what He's done in Jesus. Don't be living like you're snake bit and poisoned and dying and all you got is poison for everyone else. My goodness, we got a Savior that's overcome this world. And my church, remember this. Keep the faith. Oh, it's not he that just believes and, and then drops it, but it's he that believes to the end. Well, keep the faith, and to keep that, just keep looking to Jesus. He's the author and finisher of our faith. Oh, just keep looking to Jesus, the author of Hebrews says. No, oh, he's lifted up above everything else. If you'll just lift up your eyes, you'll see him because he's above anything that would distract you from seeing him. Oh, my friend, I pray today, today God would speak to you and call you in his marvelous salvation. For Jesus has been lifted up and today he's being lifted up right here for you. That if you, oh viewer, no matter where you're at, would look to him in this moment, and just call on his name to save you. You shall be saved. God has never lied and he never will change his mind. You will be saved if you're looking to Jesus. Oh, my friend, I just pray you'll look. And if you've looked, look again. And all church, let us not stop looking. Not at this world and the things of it and how it thinks and operates. Let's never stop looking at him. He who was slain for us, he that now lives for us, has died for us and now makes intercession, making sure we all will make heaven together someday. Oh friend, come and call on that Jesus. I look forward to seeing you when we all return. I'm counting on many people being saved out there that I'm yet to even know of. And I just pray that be so real and so true. Let us go to him in a closing prayer. Father, we just come in your presence once again. And Father, thanking you, Lord, and uh, your grand love toward all of us and for the provision of Jesus and him being lifted up in our place, him giving his life as an atonement for all of our sins. 
And Lord Jesus, we just thank you for the, for the marvelous work of salvation. It's so simple, we couldn't have it had any, anything to do with it. We would surely mess it all up. But we can all could surely look to you, Jesus, and believe that you saved us. And Father, we just pray it now, and I pray it for anyone that's out there. And then I pray for our church, Lord, that we, above all, boy, keep marching on as we're going to heaven, gathering others, spreading the gospel message of Jesus, inviting and persuading others to come on with us and to join in our parade as we all march on to heaven. Lord Jesus, be with each and every one. Bless everyone's life. Lord, we're just looking forward to when we can return. In Jesus' name, for there's no other. Amen. Amen.